Hello, I'm uh, Isam Musa uh, from First Coast Cardiovascular Institute, Jacksonville, Florida, and Associate Editor of the Journal of Catheterization and Cardiovascular Intervention. Uh, today, uh, I'm with Wes Peterson, Director of Transcatheter Valve Therapies in uh, Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Minneapolis. Thank you very much, Wes, uh, for being with us. Um, Wes is going to share with us a, uh, uh, information, uh, more detailed information about a publication in CCI uh, entitled Balloon Aortic Valvuloplasty in Patients with Severe Aortic Stenosis and Injection Fraction Less Than 20%. Uh, so Wes, I would appreciate it if you could summarize for us your work. And specifically, uh, do you do a viability study by the butamine to check viability and whether they would proceed to balloon valvuloplasty or TAVR? Thank you, Assam, for the opportunity of talking about this uh, subset of patients with severe AES and left ventricular ejection fractions of less than 20 percent. Um, as, as you know, there is not a, a best practice pattern that any of us have really adopted for this group of patients. They have a very high mortality over the subsequent six months to one year. Oftentimes, they have comorbidities and, in general, uh, present in class 4 heart failure. You know, at this point in time, and let me just say one more thing, that the STS scores in these patients, which is a poor prognosticator in our article that just uh, released in the journal, was just greater than 16%. If there uh, is any likelihood that they have pseudo-aortic stenosis, we would, in general, do a dibutamine stress test and look to document or confirm that it is true aortic stenosis. All these patients, if we've made the decision to go on uh, to more aggressive therapy, be it balloon valvuloplasty or TAVR, they go to the cardiac catheterization lab. We do coronary angiogram, bilateral heart cath, and uh, at that time perform a balloon aortic valvuloplasty. If there are uh, significant targets uh, in the coronary system, and by that I mean major branch vessels, and we think they subtend ischemia, we would do a coronary stent procedure at the same time we do a BAV. At this time, we haven't felt the need anyway to put them on advanced uh, support. Uh, what is the protocol uh, in terms of approaching patients with severe AS and low EF? In terms of a protocol, uh, we don't place them on support, intraortic balloon pump, unless they certainly come in unstable. Um, the patients that presented in our uh, series of uh, 16 patients collected from our database were all stable hemodynamically, although a few of them had been maintained on nootropic drips leading into the procedure. When we move on to balloon aortic valvuloplasty after the cardiac catheterization and coronary angiogram, I think what's very important and uh, what's worked well for us is try to minimize uh, the number of inflations. It's not uncommon for us in a person with uh, preserved left ventricular function to carry out three or four dilatations with progressively bigger balloons. Uh, in these patients, I make a, a very conscious effort to use a more definitively sized balloon, uh, generally 1.1 to 1 uh, for a balloon diameter to LVOT diameter ratio, and minimize the number of inflations, and oftentimes uh, restrict it to uh, 2 and occasionally even 1. I uh, try to avoid a serial dilatation approach. We do pace in all of these patients. And uh, the inflation time, uh, we try to keep for uh, uh, one to two seconds. Uh, I always make sure that their starting blood pressure is greater than 90 uh, before we perform the balloon inflation. And uh, if that is 
prior to the initial inflation or prior to subsequent inflations, I think it is extremely important. It is quite common for us in patients that have blood pressures in the 80s to use neosinephrine uh, to make sure that that happens. And after a single inflation, if I want to do additional inflations, uh, we would give a bolus neo neosinephrine, 100 to 200 mics, to uh, make sure that the pressure comes uh, above uh, 90. Uh, the other thing is if their cardiac output is really less than 2 and especially less than 1.8, I uh, place them on uh, dopamine and sometimes a combination of dopamine and dibutamine to uh, help their cardiac output uh, come up uh, as well as uh, pre preserve their uh, systemic uh, uh, pressures. Do some of these patients go to DAVR directly or there's always a balloon valvuloplasty trial? We um, do not proceed with transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR right away in these patients knowing uh, their very high mortality over the next year and I think whether or not these patients should be bridged or, or whether or not TAVR should be the treatment of choice uh, right out of the starting gate is uh, just not clear and certainly not from our data. Uh, thank you, Wes. Uh, what are the, uh, I've seen your mortality is zero in these patients. Are there certain uh, techniques or precautions that you take as you do the volume bavioplasty? Again, we had, uh, as you noted, there were no patients on support. Initially, two patients did not uh, recover abruptly enough for me with uh, inotropes or uh, vasoconstrictor agents and did have to put balloon pumps in both those patients and uh, there was no interprocedural mortalities or major complications. Via full disclosure, we have now been using a V8 balloon, which is an hourglass shaped balloon that I have a financial relationship, intervalve. And what this has allowed us to do is to do more rapid inflations without ventricular pacing. And the balloon generally goes up and down in two seconds. I don't have to pace. And when you measure the uh, hemodynamic compromise interval, it's generally only four seconds. And I have been even more comfortable with that balloon. And what's your practice pattern now? So our, our practice pattern with regard to these patients is to still be very cautious and conservative. I think it serves as an excellent palliative therapy, and if their uh, ejection fraction does go above 20% and hopefully 25% or greater, then we move along and offer them TAVR. I want to make one more point about the uh, dibutamine infusion, and uh, patients, or excuse me, physicians forget that the data doesn't support that it is useful in deciding whether or not left ventricular function is going to improve. It is really more of a prognosticator for interprocedural or one-year mortality with uh, an augmentation in their EF or stroke volume. So that is not a factor. And as you know, uh, about 50 percent of uh, the patients in our study did have an increase to greater than uh, 20%. This was all done pre-TAVI uh, era, so I can't comment at this point about whether or not it would be an effective uh, uh, bridge, and this is something we're certainly going to have to evaluate in the, in the future. So uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude, and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Wes.